Hi there. Um, I'm Brad. I'm coming from the University of Leeds today. Um, unfortunately, my two other co-presenters could not be here. Um, so that would have been Joanna Brown, who is a senior learning technologist, and Christopher Hassel, who is our academic deal, which is the digital education academic lead. So just a kind of a little bit about me. I've been a learning tech for roughly about seven years now. Uh, before my time at University of Leeds, I worked in FE with HE Provisions. So that was both at Barnsley College and Bishop Burton College. And I've kind of been looking at XR for probably since the start of that, back when we had the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, when you needed a big supercomputer to run a, a, a VR workshop. And it's, it's great to see uh, the progressions that have been made alongside that, as well as using uh, tech such as the Google Cardboards. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be a presentation really on the journey of our use of XR in the Faculty of Biological Sciences at University of Leeds. We're very much in the infancy of that um, at this stage. So there'll kind of be some updates on projects, kind of where did we start this journey from? And then hopefully you guys will have some questions at the end. There can be questions related to Faculty of Biological Sciences or just XR in general um, that I've experienced over the, um, the last few years. So where did we start? We started by borrowing some headsets. So we needed some headsets in the FBS faculties. We didn't have any ourselves. So what we did is we went to our Center for Immersive Tech at the university, and they had some class VR headsets um, that we used in other projects that weren't being used at the moment. So what we did is we borrowed four of these headsets to trial uh, within our labs in the FBS. So what we wanted to do is use these alongside microscopes and, and kind of see um, that kind of content through VR and kind of bring a new dynamic to that. Now, unfortunately with this, I'm not sure if any of you used class VR before or any kind of red box box VR like this. It needs to be on its own private network. Now, as you're all probably aware, IT not really great at giving you a, a, a private network or um, the ability to set something like this, this up fairly easy without going through the correct protocols, which it, it, it does make sense. It's just very frustrating from a, a, a technologist's point of view, trying to use this technology. But yeah, uh, from a security uh, side, you wouldn't be able to use these on edge your own, for example. It, it's a bit like using AirPlay on your TV and your Wi-Fi, it needs to all connect through one location. So if there were multiple people using class VR across the university, they would all kind of interlink and get stuck together. So class VR are used to dealing with schools. So that's how the, their, their kind of main target audience is schools. So they've, they've kind of got an easier um, IT system to do that. Uh, but thankfully for us, our, our business school were also going down the similar path that we were going. So it was enabled us to kind of push forward our private network agenda, as you say, with, with IT to try and get this sorted um, as, as quickly as possible. So in terms of that quickly as possible, a few months later, um, a solution was found in the process. So the second part of our journey was the University Open Day. So like I said there, it took a couple of months, but you know we got the system set up. We were able to use these um, with our kind of University Open Day. So again, we took four Class VR headsets. Um, and what we showed there were 3D models of anatomy, birds and insects. And we also did some kind of 360 imagery and 360 videos. So one of them was swimming with turtles underwater, for example. And what that did is it got, it got parents and students really kind of interested and excited in this technology and um, the opportunity that, that that could bring. So we got the, we kind of got the buy-in from the, the students and the, and the parents. But the hidden benefit that we got of this is that during the downtime in the open day, staff and academics were interested and wanted to come and have a go. So when they came, they also thought, oh, this would be, you know, great for my area. I could do X, Y, and Z. 
So they were the ones that came forward uh, with ideas for using kind of XR within their teaching a few months later. So whilst we was, it was great to test these kind of four, you know, four class VR headsets, on a scalability side, it, four headsets is not going to be enough to facilitate, you know, a full class um, experience of XR or a full class experience of a, of a virtual reality scenario. So in order for us to, to kind of move forward on the zone, um, we had to get buy-in from across the board to, to kind of invest in some more equipment. And then look, luckily for us and luckily for the university in, in general, the digital transformation at Leeds uh, funded the Helix Centre to be built. So the Helix is the university's new digital learning space for students, staff, and the, the local community. It's not just, you know, for us as, as staff and students at the University of Leeds, it's for everybody within the community. This space is, is, is bookable. It's there for, for conferences. It's there. Um, it's there to be used by all. Um, it's the culmination of years of planning around digital investment for students and it's increased digital provision for their learning. Um, not only is the, the Helix a hub of learning, but it's, like I say, it's a mix of multi-purpose spaces for events and conferences, team building, network activities, and uh, public engagement featuring immersive technologies, maker and prototyping equipment. So, you know, 3D scanners, 3D printing. Uh, the maker space has uh, techn I'll say technology, Lego. So you can come up with these creative um, kind of Lego building lessons and it's got cutting edge multimedia uh, production studios as well. So what this has got is it's got a, a bookable XR classroom, so which is a, a quite a large space really. So you could facilitate a 30 to 50 size class if, if possible with all having headsets on, there's enough, enough space in there um, to do that. And this innovation space houses our cross faculty institute as well. So the center of immersive technologies um, it comes with state-of-the-art equipment, so we put ours in for, you know, the latest MetaQuest, the latest um, equipment that's out there. And it's also got an omnidirectional treadmill, so it's a, basically a big circle where it's got these kind of roller-type um, situation going, so you can actually walk on the platform, it will walk you in the VR experience. And I believe that's one of the only ones in the UK. So it, it, it's great to have this kind of, of, of cutting edge technology. And again, within there, we've got um, professional grade studios. So for filming staff lectures, for example, or if you wanted to film content um, of, of guides for using equipment or kind of anything along them lines, uh, we've, we've got these studios and these self-recording studios as well. So if lecturers want to go in and record themselves um, to input into their lectures, they've got these nice spaces where they're nice and quiet. They've got a really good setup of a camera and microphone. And um, it gives them ability to, to do that as well as um, like podcasting setups so like with a couple of microphones in there and students can book these out as well. If students wanted to create podcasts or create um, self-recording uh, self um, studios. And then within this space, um, we've got book buckle rooms from Enterprise and also uh, there's just professionals there who were, who were there to give support to teachers, staff, students, um, any externals that are there, they've always got that um, expert to tap into within the centre. So we had the space now, and what we, tend, what we found out was that there was kind of silos of people across the university talking to each other about XR and, you know, the possibilities of what they could do with this space, the um, possibilities of what they could do with their area in XR by seeing other people's work and we thought well this isn't going to work if everybody's just you know talking amongst themselves and um keeping any ideas to themselves so what we did is we created a university-wide xr microsoft team and anybody who was involved or interested in creating projects or wanting help with their projects and even if they just wanted to get a bit of inspiration and have discussions um, they could join this team they could ask questions they could see what other people are doing so um, it was great to kind of get that set up and, and get everybody involved as well. And that also helped spark innovation in other staff members.
by them having an area where they could go and see what's being done by other people across across the university. So it's not just us as a university we're talking about XR. Um, it's the world really we're talking about XR and in terms of uh, for us in education, um, JISC have created their XR community, um, which we recently joined and we even hosted the meetup in our new Helix Centre uh, recently where we had presentations similar to uh, the one that I'm doing now. Uh, we had presentations from people within colleges, within universities, and it's really interesting because when these people get together, everybody is at such a different uh, point in their journey of XR. I, I spoke to a few people at this event who some would, had not even, you know, began looking at it. They were there to, to, to see what other people had been doing and getting their ball rolling. And you had people with fully fledged immersive environments that they were sharing as part of their presentation. Um, yeah, so just kind of describes this XR community as it's been developed to help further education and skills and higher education members across the UK to work collaboratively, sharing knowledge and best practice around augmented, mixed and virtual reality. Um, so this is also facilitated by Alt as well. So it's not just a GIST thing, it's facilitated by Alt. So I'd imagine you guys will hear about it more and the more and more popular it gets, it'll be kind of great to share what people have been doing um, in terms of XR. Uh, so it's open to, to members from FE and HE organisation. It's with an interest in extended reality, including educators, digital managers, learning technologists, IT staff, library staff, and research as well. So there's a whole host of people that you can tap into for knowledge. And again, um, there's a, a, a mailing list for this as well as a Microsoft team. So whilst we've got the University of Leeds team, we've also got a wider community in this JISC XR community where you can, again, share good practice, tap into knowledge, ask for help. Um, so that's been really positive for us. So some of the projects that um, we've been working on. So we put a call out for those interested in developing some pilot projects in our faculty. And we had five suggestions. So we had insect taxonomy, which I'm going to talk about a bit more in depth um, in the next few slides. So uh, uh, we had a couple of kind of 360 VR tour experiences, but they're not just tours, they're also educational tools. So we have the National Pig Centre uh, for Research at the University of Leeds. So, you know, the the journey of a pig's life and the the housing that they're in, you know, which feeds are for which pigs, which feeds are doing what jobs. Um, but it was also a tour of the facility for those who can't go out to the facility because it's off site and it's, it's not necessarily a place where you would keep going to constantly. You would only go once maybe in your in your time at the university. So it's good to go to, to get your pre-knowledge before going, but then also to use that as a revision tool after. We've also got lab tours uh, for 360. Again, these are tours, but also um, the one that we're doing at the moment in a mass spectronomy lab is it's kind of laid information. So on the outside, you would do a tour of the lab and you would get basic information about these machines that are there. However, the academic then wanted further information for those who were maybe doing postgraduate and wanted more in-depth, you know, talk throughs and knowledge and manuals and these uh, machinery. And you could do that by going down in layers. So it's a, a resource that's available for a wide variety of students. And then there's a, a couple of ideas that have not been kind of explored yet, but they're also um, kind of ideas that are there ready to go when possible. So one of them is also simulations so sports science for example the sports science simulation that we've been suggested and talking to about an academic is um, the idea of a, a sports injury on a football pitch and you've got to uh, react to that scenario you know run onto the pitch and and kind of go through the process of what you would do there and that's not something you could easily just set up and do whenever however the xr experience would allow that to happen so virtual reality You've got to come up with some kind of gimmicky name to draw people in when we talk about this at stands. So virtual reality is Chris, who's, who's unfortunately not here. He's, he's doing the insect taxonomy project. Um, so these are just a few slides from uh, when he does his uh, presented on the uh, taxonomy. So visual aids have had a long history in entomology. Um, 
yeah, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a subject matter expert in insect taxonomy. So if you've got any questions regarding insects, I'm not the person. I'll pass you Chris the email. Um, but apparently in 13,000 BC, that's when the first rock depicted bees in paintings. Um, and then, you know, carved amulets of beetles. And there's just been um, imagery of, of bugs over, um, uh, over history. So traditional teacher methods have limitations. So uh, specimens can be quite hard to, to come by. Um, there's limited access to specimens um, in the topic, uh, uh, according to Chris. And live insects are, uh, are hard to study. I mean, that's just a thing on its own. You won't like to study a wasp if it were alive. And then limitations of books and illustrations. Now, I do think this is an extreme example of a, a limitation of a ladybird however there is still limitations even in detailed um illustrations within books there's, there's still some limitations there so again access to specimens that would be quite difficult to to kind of get a hold of are also a lot easier by using 3d models um it's interactive and engaging learning experiences and then it's safe and efficient alternate to destructive sampling so you're not you know killing bugs for the sake of just seeing them when you can also use 3D models. So 3D scans are, are, are kind of rich teaching resources. So this is actually a 3D model uh, that you're looking at. I could pick and move that around. Um, but what this means, is it brings a new dynamic to the content being viewed. Um, the more interaction that you have with the model may help with, you know, retaining that information of what you're studying and what you're learning about. And then you could tailor that information to how you please. So 3D environments are teaching environments. So asynchronous materials, in-class demonstrations, and shared learning environments. So learners can view an environment at their own pace um, and explore at a rate that helps them learn that information the best. Alternatively, headsets like Class VR, you can also do guided VR experiences where you can tell the students where to look at and you, know, you can move them along at a pace uh, that you want to, but there's that opportunity there to kind of do both. So here's just a little video of um, Chris's project. So he uses Sketchfab and Gravity Sketch for this. So Sketchfab is an online tool where you can get 3D models. Um, you can buy them, you can get them for free. So I know that the ones that Chris is using here, all these were free. It, it just downloaded these and populated them into Gravity Sketch and built a, a educational tool with that. So Gravity Sketch is a, it's a 3D platform uh, where you can create, collaborate and review. So it's a bit like a, a, a big drawing board in there. So you can get your controller and draw around things. So if he was to teach a lesson on one of these insects, he could cast this headset on the board, enhance these bugs, and then begin drawing and annotating around these bugs um, whilst he's in the VR space. But also with Gravity Sketch, you can see outside of the headset if you've got an augmented one as well. So you can see what your class is doing whilst you're in that headset. So a summary of the virtual reality is it's reversing a decline of interest in a skill, uh, in skills in a, a neglected subject. So Chris talks about how insect taxonomy would become in a subject that students just weren't really bothered for or interested for. And this and is hoping that these kind of experiences can spark new life in, into that. Initial pilots using off-the-shelf uh, softwares and OERs. So this, this um, project that is put together, um, he had access to a, a, a headset, um, obviously been an academic deal. He is very into this kind of thing, so he's got his own <laughs> headset. Um, but he was able to build this project for, for free, essentially. If you had access to one of these headsets, you could build, you know, this it's a completely free experience that's been built. You don't need to get in any extra stuff. You might buy some models of insects that um, might be more suited to what you need, but you know it's off the shelf. It, it were it were kind of free to make. And yeah, the digital models are proliferating, which is basically a fancy way to say there's lots of models being put on <laughs> at a good rate. So yeah, so the potential benefits that Chris sees is the active learning. Um, increased engagement, digital skills development, and then reduced environmental impact. So obviously you get that active learning through the 
the the use of your hands and movement to to navigate that space and then skills like using new and different software help with that um digital upskilling so learnings for us in fbs what have we learned so far so staff and academics are excited by the prospects of what xr technology can bring to their teaching um with support needed from us as learning technologists to kind of give our you know technical know-how as well as our pedagogical input as to how they could create uh, an experience. Um, um, academics might struggle to see how XR could be relevant to their area, but sometimes it just takes a quick discussion of what they're actually doing within their topics for you then to be able to give a, a, an educated um, example of where it could be used. So in the past, when I've had English staff come to me, go, oh, well, how can we use you know, VR um, in English? It's like, well, you could use it for creative writing if you used a, a 360 image of an area as opposed to a, an image on a sheet you're tapping into your students other senses then and then that can create a whole new dynamic to a piece of creative writing it's just something like that just to spark a bit of innovation in staff to help them um see the benefits of this uh collaboration is key so the just gets our community they're working with other staff across the university that's been key for us and then communications integral. Um, you'll find that if you're working within groups of staff are trying to achieve one um, project of XR, there might be creative differences. There might be um, staff wanting to go in a different um, uh, purpose as to where that XR should should lead to. So you kind of need to keep them all on the initial um, track of what the outcomes and the aims of the project is especially with xr it, it really needs to be purposeful you really need to get your staff excited for it but also in a way that's not still can be seen as quite gimmicky so it needs to be really purposeful and not just creating an xr project for the sake of you know creating one just because it's cool it really needs to be to be purposeful for it to be um, for its longevity but it's obviously not all been uh swings and roundabouts so some of the barriers and challenges so onboarding onboarding is a very kind of difficult process especially when you're using um, hardware such as say the MetaQuest 2 which requires all students to have their own account they have to log into the device as soon as they come into the classroom and if just by any chance there's an update on that headset it will do it there and then um what as soon as you've logged in you can't pre-update them now I don't know whether that's still uh, the same case however you might need to run pre-lesson um, account setups you might need to get students into your room to you know get set up before you you kind of go ahead with it um accessibility so being aware of the the content that you're creating can you also add audio in there can you add text um we're using software at the moment that we've got a site license for is Finglink, so you might be um aware of that through other e-learning um, use but we use it for virtual reality and that taps in, that's got um, integrated with Microsoft Immersive Reader. So, you know, there's accessibility um, available there. And then the scalability, so room size. So yes, whilst we've got the Helix for those booking the room, it's one space. So if there's four members of staff who want to run a big session, um, it's not possible if they wanted to all do it at the same time. So it's about kind of having that continuity plan and, and making most of the space that you've got um, for that. So our next steps um, is to kind of continue with our projects. Um, Insect Taxonomy is currently being trialled with students and the pig centre and the lab tours are currently underway with photos have been taken and um, you know exported. The current camera that we're using for that is a Insta One X2. Um, so it's not the latest camera, but it's a, it's a good camera and it, and it provides high quality photos. And then kind of looking at the uh, JISC-XR community and overall collaboration opportunities to further our knowledge as well as share our um, projects. So that's kind of a, an overview of our journey. Um, I'm aware there might be a lot more questions and time is left for. Um, I'm going to be here today and tomorrow. Um, if you want if you want to catch me, my email address is there as well. Also, that link at the bottom is more information about the JISC-XR community and how you could potentially join that. So again, if you've got an interest in um xr and um you want to kind of look further into that and be a part of this group um if possible 
if you go to the Jigs XR Community UK site, there's more information on there. Um, but yeah, is there any any questions? Um, you find... <laughs> um, it's sort of a bit accessible, uh, accessibility question, but in regards to uh, motion sickness, do you find that any of your, um, that any of your teaching or anything you've tried has suffered as a result of motion sickness and what would you do? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's all, everyone's going to have a different reaction to um, virtual reality and the biggest problem with the motion sickness comes from the, it's the 360 degree experiences because if you're moving your body or your head um, that's not on a swivel, your brain can't comprehend that you're moving forward whilst that image is not moving. So that's where most of the sickness comes in. So it's tailoring our sessions where if it is 360, you, you can sit down and be, you know, in one central location and then move your head to prevent that. And then in terms of the more immersed experiences, um, ways to kind of combat that. Uh, I mean, I personally done it in the past is when I've got the headset on, I kind of leave a little gap at the bottom so that if I need to ground myself and look at the floor, um, I can do, but everybody's everybody's got a different reaction. There's no one answer that I could give. Some people can last one minute in it. One, some people can last five hours. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do one more last question in the room. We have a break. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know about uh, how do you support academics in terms of uh, fundings? Because, you know, all those, you know, you, I don't know, you have a, a dedicated team that can do XR or how do you redirect to academic to academics who come to see you says, I want to do this project and this project. Uh, it's costly, it takes time to do those things. Do you have a, a place? So, so in, in terms of funding, it, it completely depends on the actual project itself. So a lot of the projects we're in at the moment are 360 um, kind of VR experiences, which we facilitate as a learning technology team. So across the university, we've just had, well, I'll say we've just, last year we had a big funded in towards digital. So there is learning technologists, senior learning technologists, assistant learning technologists that spread out all across to dedicated departments, hence why I'm part of the Faculty of Biological Sciences. So if somebody in my department wanted a VR experience, we would, as the technology team, create that. The kind of issue comes when it's, say, uh, a fully immersive environment. So, you know, we can pick things up and it's part of, say, the, the quest where it's a fully built environment. So currently for that, um, we're working with our kind of production team and tapping into uh, knowledge and skills across the university to, to come together for these projects. Um, kind of down the line, and as the Helix Centre picks up, we might you know, fund a dedicated member of staff who can build um, environments. So in terms of funding at the moment, it's very much in-house and we're working with what we've got. Um, and if the excitement picks up and it gets used a lot across the university, there might be more funding that goes into dedicated staff to do that. Um, but yeah, we're tapping into what we've got at the moment and the experiences that we can tailor for it. Um, uh, I'm not going to say simple because not simple, but um, they're easy enough for us as learning text to complete. So Fingling, for example, it's pretty much taking 360 imagery and jigsawing it into there and then kind of dragging and dropping um, gaze points and information points and uh, and things on there. So, yeah, that, that's that's where... You, you don't want to build connection with like Meta or, you know, Google to help you to... So this is where we hope that the community is kind of coming to play and we find out more about what other people are doing in terms of like those partnerships. So like I say, we're very much at the University of Leeds in our infancy of XR. So there are avenues that we probably will go down as soon as there's more kind of buying for XR across and the 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 Helix gets up and away running. So Helix is is fully opening uh, I believe this September. So it's not even fully open for bookable yet. So as soon as that gets going we hope that the buy-in will mean that more investment takes place. Thanks all. You have all earned a break and um, our two presenters are happy to take more questions on the side. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody wants to know more about the GIST group that uh, Brad was discussed about on the theory group or about those that have got on the
телевизор в интернете себе не доставляет. Ну, по вам, Юрий. 